to explain the quality of the concept of the divine names and attributes. And the key concept to understand and to be are that the names are the relationships that link the phenomenal with the non-phenomenal. They are the things by which Allah SWT brings creation into existence of the names, all effects, all places, all athar of Allah's activities can be discerned. Master Ibn Arabi, out his, his works, uses a number of terms and a number of key concepts and terminologies that are important for us to know and recognize if we are truly to come to grips with the openings that can come through reflecting on what he said, appreciating that these are the visions, the illuminated visions of a true Gnostic. So the description that the Mahabi uses to explain reality, the universal reality, or haqiqa as we call it, are an important means by which we can advance our knowledge of what the Mahabi said and hopefully use that knowledge in order to improve our ability to understand and find, inshallah, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa Throughout history, the system of Ibn Arabi has been described as an Arabic wahdat al-wujud, or the oneness of being. It is basically a shorthand for trying to understand in word, in a single phrase, what Ibn Arabi said. And that, that word, unfortunately, has become, to a large extent, the way in which the whole system, it is the, the, which the system of Ibn Arabi has been seen. And with the passage of time, it has taken on various shades and colorings that make it basically, although in and of itself it is not an incorrect description of the system, it has become known now as the way in which the Arabi sees the presence and the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everywhere. It has taken on the colorings of pantheism. Pantheism, which is associated with other systems of belief, has no place in the Arabi. In the mind of Ibn Arabi, the works of, of Ibn Arabi, Wahda al wujud or the oneness of being, describes only one aspect of the undeniable reality that Allah is everywhere. That Allah is everywhere, but at the same time, Allah is nowhere. It is this He and not He. The, the patience that we put to the system by describing it as a, as a principle of seeing Allah everywhere is true. But it is also not true because Allah is not limited. He is delimited by any definitions and any finite descriptions. He is both transcendent as well as similar. And this is the central feature of the great master's system, I believe. It is the he not he, the neither nor, the both and the and. It is not the idol. The system that allows one to reconcile opposites and in the reconciliation of opposites for each tawheed that is what the oneness of being means and has nothing to do with the pantheism that is ascribed to him the existence of entified things derive their their origin derive their force that brought them into being through the effulgence of the being itself. So all is Allah 
at the same time, the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be known. And the manifestations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are everywhere. So it is through the manifestations, through the traces, through the various infinite means by which Allah manifests Himself through creation, can we come to understand Allah Can we to comprehend the divine vastness? Things, existent entities, as they relate to being, are in some ways analogous to the multiplicity of thoughts that occur to a single person. Our thoughts are many. They, are, they can range all over the place. They each have their own apparent existence, and they re- relate back to us in a form of iteration, in a form of an iterative mechanism. So although we originate thoughts, thoughts in their multiplicity have a type of existence that is, appears to be independent. But as soon as we stop thinking of them, these thoughts cease to have any reality. They may affect the process by which we bring out other thoughts. So in a very imperfect and perhaps crude analogy, existent entities, entified things in the system of Ibn Arabi relate to being in the same way that thoughts relate to a person. There is wujud, which is sheer being, and there is that which is brought into existence, which is mojud. These two time and time again in the great mystery. Things that have been brought into existence as a result of the effulgence of being through the action of the divine beings have a certain what he calls mahiya. Mahiya in Arabic is that which defines it, that which is. Uh, in, Af- in English it's uh, perhaps clumsily translated as quiddity. The thing that gives a thing its identification. All things, as they are brought out of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into existence, have that element to them, have, have that quiddity to them, that makes them separate from the force that brought them to be. So quiddity is the feature, or mahir is the feature of entified things. At the same time, quiddity or thingness itself cannot be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah knows Allah. So existence in all of its manifestations, in all of its forms, in all of its ranges and hierarchies, we talked last time about the rankings and the fadl in existence, are <coughs> ultimately originate their source, their, their, their apparent power, their apparent quiddity from existence, from being itself. This cannot be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, only Allah knows Allah. In themselves, therefore, in and of themselves, things do not really exist. When we say things don't exist, it does not mean that they do not have a quantifiable form, that they don't have a meaning, they don't have dimensions, but that the source of their existence, the thing that brings them to a sense of apparent existence, is not really theirs. It's borrowed. And the borrowed existence that all entified things have come from the force and the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into bringing them into existence. So the apparent existence of things that we see around us at all levels of creation, at the level of the cosmos, at the level of the spiritual world, the imaginal world, the world of bodies and masses, the world of the microcosm, our existence purely a reflection of the one and only one being. That is the ultimate source of existence is the property of sheer being in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's brought into existence as through the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it's brought through existence through what are known as the ayan factor, inshallah I'll come to that later. And what is what is not in existence which is purely a mental concept, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the system of the is all. Therefore, all encompasses all that could and all that could not be. So nothingness is, has the attribute of impossibility, so it's a mental construct. 
is not the construct that we can use to understand a lot of time. So existence, wujud, and the existent entities are the twin features of the system. It drives its energy, its force, its entire uh, definition from the one and only source of being. Uh, the Arabi uses another term which, he, which is important for us to understand and to, to uh, try to delve into what he's saying, are what he calls a munkinat, the possible things. The definition of reality of the great master has as its pinnacle and as its as its central core the existence of the necessary being from which all existence, all power of being emanates. What we call in Arabic Rajib al This necessary being or the concept of necessary being is also found in some of the uh, great Islamic philosoph- uh, philosophers such as Ibn Sina. But Ibn Arabi brings it in into the illumination and into the uh, visions that he had. The necessary being for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in his knowledge all that is, all that can be, and all that is possible. So all possible things that can exist, either exist in terms of their quantification, in terms of their mass, in terms of their imaginal state, in terms of their angelic state, or they can exist possibly in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way in which entities come into existence from their potential existence is what the Arabi calls tarjih. This is a very important concept and it is the basis of Allah's rahmah. The Arabi says all knowledge is subsumed in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows all. Those entities that can be brought into existence because they exist in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala require another action on them. This action is the action of tarjih, which is preponderance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his knowledge, weighs the scales between possible existence and real existence, and tips it in one direction or the other. The choice that Allah makes between the infinite possible things by bringing them into existence is known as tarjih, or preponderance. Nothing can be brought into the realm of the cosmos, the cosmos in its entirety, at all of its various levels, at all of its various hierarchies, is in reality the action of the murajjah, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the preponderator on potential things to make them into existing things. So all existing things have their root in their potentialities in the knowledge and in the mind. And this tarjih, this preponderance, makes things exist rather than be non-existent but existent in Allah's knowledge. So Allah as the marjah, Allah as the preponderator, is what tips the scales between non-existence in terms of the various rankings and hierarchies of the universe and in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but non-existent in terms of its of the into a form of reality. But also that the whole purpose of journeying, the whole purpose of suffer, of all great Muslims, in the various levels and ranks that they reach, is to discover the actions of the preponderator. Along the means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sana, the maker. And it is the fashioner and maker of all infinite things and the bringer into the cosmic order of the realities of things as they reflect his existence. Therefore, the action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the murajjah, as the preponderator, allows those people who are in safa, those who are journeying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to see the necessity of the necessary being because all around us exists and the existence that they have derives from the tipping of the scale. We cannot see and we will, we cannot aspire and we should never even consider understanding the totality of the knowledge of Allah. But 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy, through his actions as a preponderator, brings potential things into existence to allow us to see the necessity of their being a necessary being, logical you. So the cosmos in its entirety is merely a summation of all the possible things that <coughs> exist in the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tipped over into the scale of preponderance over non-existence. A word that keeps up, keeps up coming, keeps coming regularly in the Futuhat and the and the Fasus al Hikam, in the various other treatises and works of the Master, and have subsequently come down the ages as part of the uh, terminology, as it were, of all Sufis, of all those who seek in a way, is the word al ayan al Thabta, or the immutable entities. This has been badly translated in my mind as archetypes or models. Immutable entities of in Arabic are not models from which other things are fashioned. They are the by which all possible things exist in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are basically the spirit of things. As man has a spirit or meaning, as every entified thing has a core to itself that is its substantive meaning, then the substantive blueprint for all infinite possibility of created and non-created things are formed and found in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this badly translated archetype from which all things can and do come into being is the are the immutable entities associated with these things. They are the master blueprint from which each and every possible form, an infinite form of individuation can take place. That's why a model is not really a good a good word, or the archetype is not really a good word, because it tends to uh, denote that one can basically uh, cookie cut or produce models according to a certain form. In Allah's knowledge, nothing occurs twice. No single thing, no single action can be repeated. Therefore, although it is a form of blueprint, it's the blueprint that is associated in and of that particular entified thing. He takes a middle way, and how he takes a middle way when talking about the Ayan chapter or the immutable entities, whether the universe as a whole is originated, that is, it's Muhaddad or Hajj. There's been a dispute that was going on uh, prior to this time by all the great theologians and thinkers in Islam and created a lot of dissension and conflict between them. But now he comes, his answer is that it's both. It is both. Eternal, because the blueprint of it is eternal in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is muhaddad in the sense that through the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, time comes into existence. And time is the scale by which or the uh, ajal, the time scale of all things, is part of the reflection of entities that come from non-existence into existence. So the preponderance of one or the other of the immutable entities through the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the marajah or the preponderator comes out of the immune entities the final effects and these are acted upon by the divine names and the divine attributes so the immutable entities that exist as the archetypes or models for each specific potential thing comes into existence as a result of the action of the divine names on it and both of these makes the potential thing possible and makes the possible thing reflective in the existing order. So this concept of immutability or reboot is a very important notion in trying to understand how creation takes place moving from one form into another. And bringing into existence this whole process of preponderance of one potential thing over another, giving one thing a type of existence over another, through a blueprint, which is the ayan factor, through the actions of divine names, these are 
the processes of bringing things into being, the processes of be. Be in Allah's command, kum, for things to come into existence, it is this. It is the action of these various forces that move things in their totality from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into a form of existence within the hierarchy of creation. I will, I will uh, try to, uh, towards the end of the talk, I will try to see how the uh, Arabi anchors all these things to Quranic uh, verses and to Hadith of Prophet to show that this is not really something that is purely constructed out of kind of logical uh, construct or some spiritual hallucinations. These are really visionary illuminations, but it is not possible for a person to have them unless he is truly anchored in the deep. Another word that we, another term that we use frequently is the locus of manifestation or, or tajalli. Locus of manifestation. It is not really the way in which properties manifest themselves. All manifestation belongs to Allah SWT. The name of Waha that uh, we find in Surah Al-Hadid. The name Waha is the manifest. So one of Allah's divine names and attributes is to manifest things. Therefore the whole process of manifestation and the whole uh, association of things with manifestation derive their manifestation from Allah SWT. So things do not manifest. We can't say this thing manifests itself. We can say it is a place or a locus in which we are able to see the actions of Allah SWT. And this goes throughout all the structures of creation. Allah is the manifest. Allah is the dahir, is the actions of Allah SWT that we can witness with our own eyes. We can see with our own eyes. We can assess with our, with, our, with our own eyes. Wherever we turn, whatever we see, it is a place, the point, the action, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests, not himself, but manifests manifestation. The process of appearance, the process of bringing things into existence is what the locus of manifestation or the, the rule is all about. Allah is the bottom. Allah is the non manifest, is for our intellect, for our aql, for our heart to understand. Our eyes, basar, in sight in Arabic, is what allows us to see the manifest. Our hearts and our intellect allow us to see the body, the non-manifest. Oh, the manifestation of Allah SWT in the cosmos, the cosmos comes into being. The entire order of the universe, the entire order of creation is perfect to be. Through the word al batil the non-manifest, we try to understand Allah SWT. So Allah's mercy is infinite. His manifestation is constant pointer to those of us, inshallah, who are on the path, who are able to, to see the reality of Allah's manifestation, who are able to affirm His oneness. And through the bottom, through His non-manifestation, we trigger our intellects and then ultimately our hearts they are turned in the right way to see the word al batil of the divine name al batil the non-manifest in our hearts so entities as such do not manifest it is Allah that gives them their potential for manifestation multiplicity therefore what we see kufra as an Arabi says multiplicity of the non-existent that is those entities that do not have an individual independent existence. Everything comes from Allah SWT. Allah Ta'ala is the Zahir, He is the manifest, He is the one. Allah is one. One of Allah's names is the manifest, therefore manifestation is one. All existence returns back to Allah SWT. Another feature, another aspect of manifestation is self disclosure. Or again, the word in Arabic is the whole and or tajalli, it can be both. Self disclosure is the mechanism by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the potential of recognition in all entified things that they belong to Allah and then they will return back to Allah. The name, the manifest, is the disclosure by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all 
created entities. All creation is a manifestation of the name, the manifest. And all knowledge and understanding is the reflection of the name al Baba. This is non-recognition of the fact that there is no existence separate and independent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. or ilm, true ilm, true knowledge, is the knowledge of verification that all existence derives from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we can fuqaq, the verified existence. These, the knowledge of the verified existence, the knowledge that all is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a function of that entity's ability to receive, to be a receptacle, and has the potential of understanding that knowledge. What he calls qabul, which is receptivity, and istadad, which is preparedness. All entified things have both of these. Man has one that is variable, the preparedness of man to accept and understand the uniqueness and the unicity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a property that is only his. It is not the property of other entified things. Other entified things have their ability to be receptive to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they have the preparedness to accept the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A tree is in a state of worship from the day it was a seed until the day it fell or it dies. We can choose. We have the qabool, we have the receptivity. That is a constant feature in man. Preparedness in man, the istadad in man, to interpret all this information, the spiritual data that comes to us, to interpret it in a logical, in a spiritually logical way, to allow us to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our istadad and our preparedness. And that, we will come to that later, inshallah, is a function of the quality of the heart. One who can reflect the reality of being in its entire splendor is the insan al kami is the perfect being, is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and all those who are near or have been overwhelmed by the prophetic light. Otherwise, we are all within higher or lesser degrees of proximity to that station. Of our preparedness, the quality of our istadah. The stations, the self disclosure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are never ending. That is necessary by the word, the divine name, the new light. And Arabi says, from the divine name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is light. Light has to disclose itself in order for light to manifest itself. So that through the actions of the word light, through the effulgence of the word nur, things are constantly being lit, things are being constantly illuminated. So the process of illumination is really a question, an issue for those people who are inclined in that direction to, um, to allow that light to act upon them. The greater the intensity of the light, the more we recognize the total manifestation, and therefore we recognize the relative non-existence of creation and the absolute existence of the Creator. It may not accept the rays of the sun, but the sun continues to shine. The light of Allah Taala is always there. It is always there for, for us and for all created entified things to witness. Whether we choose to be in that state of illumination or whether we choose to accept darkness does not diminish one iota, the intensity, the infinite intensity of the illumination that comes from the Nur of Allah. The quality of the, the vessel, what he calls the Qadim, to receive 